The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai, hoki mai, kia The Fold, e mihi nei, ko Duncan Grey tōku ingoa. My guest this week is Dylan Cleaver, who is a sports journalist of 25 years experience. He's a long time veteran of the Herald, where he has for the last, I think, decade at least, been, been their sort of chief sports writer and reporter. He's obviously done done the rounds from the, the, the match reports and the... Um, sort of preview circuit that, that everyone comes in on, but what he's really made his bones and his reputation and probably alongside uh, Dana Johansson is, is, you know, would be our most acclaimed and uh, sports, sports writer in New Zealand, I think, um, is his investigations, his feature writing and the, the sort of really deep analysis that he brings. As, as he says in the, the, the interview today that he you know, hasn't had to have been tied to a specific sport and that's led to him having a very rich and rounded career and one that has abruptly taken a, a very um, brave, bold turn in that a couple of months ago he resigned from the Herald to... He's taken a, a very bold and brave move to launch The Bounce, uh, a brand-new sports newsletter on Substack, the bounce is is going to come out three times a week. I've worked with uh, Dylan a, a little um, on on it, just kind of you know as as a person to bounce ideas off. And you know, based on the conversations we've had, I think it's going to be a pretty special product. It's also going to syndicate uh, weekly on the spinoff, so you'll be able to get a flavour for it by reading on the site. But if you want the whole the whole thing uh, I encourage you to, to sign up um, to to the newsletter which you should be able to find on the spin-off today the the what what Dylan describes in this interview is is a, a quite radical change in how sports journalism is practiced in in New Zealand and it's it's all over the world I mean the the industry that he talks about coming into had specialist reporters covering just bowls or just athletics it, which is just unimaginable now. And with that has gone, you know, some of the, the texture and the ability to travel and the just the the breadth of what sports writing could be. And I think the bounce is, is Dylan's attempt to, to reclaim that. Before we get into it, I just want to make a huge, huge thank you to the spin-off members, everyone who has contributed. We've had a, a good rush of, of, of members in over the past few weeks as we've been in level four lockdown, and that has gone some way to mitigate the commercial impacts of the lockdown, which have been pretty huge, and we are processing it the way I, I guess a lot of businesses are. And for those who are long-time members or who've just joined up, you are the, the reason we get to, to do our jobs each day, and, and I just, just can't, can't thank you enough. Anyway, with that, um, we'll get into this. It's Dylan Cleaver talking about his brand new venture, The Bounce on the Fold. Uh, kia ora, Dylan, and welcome to The Fold. Hello, Duncan. Nice to be here. And, uh, you know, congratulations. You've chosen, to, you're launching The Bounce today. It's an incredibly exciting day. You're launching a sports newsletter when sports is banned around the country. Yeah, brave. Well, <laughs> brave. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm a little nervous. Uh, look, I, I spent some reasonably sleepless nights over the last couple of months actually ever since I committed to doing this uh last night was no different um it's a nerve-wracking time but it's also tremendously exciting I have been at the Herald for a long long time I loved it there but it just felt like 
this was the time to do something different. Ideally, it wouldn't be during lockdown and it wouldn't be when a lot of sport is, uh, you know, taken off the table, so to speak. But here we are. Do you want to talk about the scope of the bounce? Because while you're absolutely right, you'd like there to be some sport being played, ideally, uh, domestically, for it. Because of the scope of it, that it is about the off-field and the business of sports as much as the on, it, it feels like it's not actually the worst time because you know this will be confronting sports in a pretty visceral way as, as much as anything else. Yeah, last time there was a lockdown, I found there was actually some quite rich material to be had. And just for example, I mean, the the need for perhaps private equity in sport and particularly rugby is probably more acute now uh, with lockdown and the fact that a lot of domestic rugby has been taken off the table last season. We're not quite sure how the next few months are going to look now either. So, yeah, there is plenty to write about. There's plenty to dig into. Uh, but just for the pure sports fan in me, I'd still like to be watching it as well. Tell me about you know, the path that led you here, you know, what sports journalism has been to you, and then, you know, and this will necessarily be a relatively long answer, how doing it for New Zealand's biggest newspaper changed to the point where, where you were open to, to a, a project like this. Yes, yeah, so I've been a sports journalist for 25 years now. For the most part, I've had little diversions into other things, but um, since, I've twen- since I've been in my 20s, I've called myself a sports journalist, and it's been wonderful. Uh, I think a lot of people would see it as their dream job. I certainly, um, I certainly do. You know, sports was a passion all through school, all through my youth. I wasn't good enough to take my sporting career to any great heights but I combine that with a passion for words and and the language and you know it kind of carved out my ideal career uh, I joined the Herald on Sunday in 2004 for the launch I got there about two days before launch and it is one of the best decisions I've ever made I mean I, I don't think there are going to be too many more journalists from this day forward that get to say they worked on a startup newspaper. Uh, I mean, that's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Uh, and like I had the um, time of my life there, it was a, I guess in many ways, it was an awkward start. The Herald on Sunday wasn't universally embraced when it first um, hit the shelves, I think it's fair to say. Uh, car crash on Sunday, I think it was nicknamed for a while, perhaps unkindly. But I think the sports section in that newspaper always had a bit of credibility and that was due to the almost the force of personality of a guy called Paul Lewis who was the original sports editor. Um, over time I I went into the Daily Herald in about two thousand and nine when that was still there was a clear delineation between the Herald on Sunday staff and the staff of the Weekend Herald and the and the Daily Herald. There is no such, um, I mean, those boundaries have been well and truly blurred by now. Uh, and that was different and still tremendously enjoyable. But from the, probably the last decade, really, there has been a gradual um, hollowing out of sports departments, not just at the Herald. I mean, it'd be really unfair for me to sit here and criticise them as, uh, you know, being the the worst example of this. Um, we saw throughout the country regional newspapers basically clear out their sports desks. The commitment to travelling to sport um, waned a little. And I was fortunate. I'd kind of ring-fenced myself into an area of sport where that didn't affect me so much. I, I wasn't a, a beat man or anything, like I wasn't the Warriors beat man or the All Blacks beat man. I, I kind of covered more issues than sport, but you still feel it. I felt it acutely that there wasn't the commitment to sport that there used to be. And look, it's this has been a very long process and a, and a very long answer, I'm sorry, Duncan, but I, I'm getting I'm getting there. And that, I asked for it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, for the last five years, I felt that if I'm going to do something, I need to do it now. And that sounds an incredibly long lead in time, and it is, but 
finally, you know, the, um, COVID hit. A lot of my friends lost their jobs. Um, a lot of them had come back on contracts, but it just it felt a little bit different for me. And I felt if I'm ever going to do something different, this is the time to do it. And I eventually mustered up the kind of courage to deinstitutionalize myself. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and here we are. I'm about to start a Substack newsletter. Yeah, do you, do you want to talk about the the newsletter format? Why? Why you've chosen that, and what what you intend to do with it specifically? Like, what what as a product? What will it be for those who subscribe? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's quite difficult to answer right at the moment because it could be anything. Uh, and I'm really excited by that. I mean, I love the craft of sports writing. Um, I love sport, so I can see it going in all sorts of different directions from day to day. You see, and. Uh, the, the more it was explained to me, the more the newsletter format appealed to me because you are going directly to people who want to read about sport. And I think sports readers are quite Catholic in their taste. Uh, I mean, you get, oh, I could, I could run off a, a number of kind of styles that I'd like to do. I'd, I love oral histories. I love good oral histories. Um, I love opinion columns. Uh, I, I don't even mind the odd kind of sporting polemic where you take extreme views of something and then gradually get talked down from that. Uh, I love uh, the long read, the features, uh, analysis, the business of sport, the actual match, obviously, and, and analysis of games. So, you know, I don't... I've, I'm being very clear in my welcome note to potential subscribers that you can expect anything and everything, really. I, I would um, hate to pigeon myself into a role as, you know, the guy that looks at um, the money behind sport or purely looks at the All Blacks and, and the Black Caps because they're our two, I guess, flagship teams. Yeah, I, I know that's a very woolly and vague answer, but, but it's true. I want to write about everything and I want to do it in a whole bunch of different ways. No, it's, it's inspiring, to be honest. And, and that is the, the freedom that you're granted by the newsletter format and that, you know, for better or worse, you're the editor and the writer and yeah. uh, <laughs> no one can spike your pieces but you. Um, the, the thing that sort of strikes me as interesting hearing you talk then was, you know, saying that it isn't just going to be rugby and cr- cricket. Um, that's one of the, I think, probably positive changes that's happened to sports journalism over the past 25 years, where it was, you know, again, stretching back into my own memories here, but there was a much narrower vision of what sports coverage was, which sports were covered, and, you know, you know what women's sports was, was barely touched outside of probably the, the Silver Ferns, for example, and, you know, things like MMA or, or um, the, the kind of the ability to watch, you know, to be a, a very committed and a knowledgeable NBA fan from New Zealand uh, just just didn't exist. You know, how? what, what are the good things about the way that um, sports journalism, sports fandom, I guess, has, has changed over, over your career and how will that impact the, the newsletter? Yeah, you're kind of right there, and uh, um, but not exactly. I, I actually... Um, I was thinking about this, funnily enough, just yesterday, that when I first went into newsrooms, like, for example, the New Zealand Herald newsroom, they had a specialist athletics writer. Uh, they, they had a guy that looked at bowls as, you know, one of his, his major rounds, golf. Um, so actually there was a lot of sport covered, but very traditional sport. Uh that's been crunched down now that you get very few specialist sports writers that look after a round, but you're, you're very right in other ways in that the digital world, ESPN, Sky, uh, you know, having the rights to ESPN has brought the big four American leagues into our lounge rooms. Um, and you're finding a lot of kids, uh, it's, it's sad in a way, but it's true. They're, they're more interested in, the LA Lakers and the Boston Celtics than they are the Blues and the Crusaders. Um, women's sport is, you know, it's been a heated debate for years about traditional media's treatment of women's sport. And it has at times been lip service, 
but I certainly see an awakening there and a far greater emphasis put on women's sport. And it's and I want to make clear that that's not in a patronising way either. I think one of the um, wonderful things about the, the digital world and the analytics is we've seen there's a genuine audience and uh, you know a commercial imperative for women's sport that possibly wasn't there in the past or or we failed to see that it was there in the past. So, yeah, I mean, again, all things that I'd love to fold into this newsletter and, and you know, make readers aware of. We'll just quickly take a break uh, right now and come back with more from Don Cleaver on The Fold. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Uh, welcome back to The Fold. Uh, I'm here with Dylan Cleaver, former chief sports writer of The Herald and now launching his own substack called The Bounce, which, which comes out today and you should absolutely subscribe to. One thing that you'll be able to cover in The Bounce that, you know, I think that people at the big media organisations have sometimes struggled with is is the monolith and the, the, the sort of very entrenched power structure that is New Zealand rugby. Do you want to talk about the media's relationship to New Zealand rugby, particularly through the All Blacks, and how, you know, at times there, there is an imbalance there um, to do with the sort of access and um, and the commercial relationships that are wrapped around the All Blacks that, that people don't see but they probably feel? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point, and it is one that I'll, I'll be diving into reasonably early and in different sorts of ways too. I mean, the, the joke, well, it wasn't really a joke, it was a, a truism, was that rugby was the one sport in New Zealand where the media needed them more than they needed the media. And they traded in on that, I would say, excessively over the years in, in terms of access, in terms of, um, I wouldn't say so much these days, but for a long time, there was a general disdain uh, from New Zealand rugby to the media, uh, and it's it's kind of clouded a lot of what happens here. And just for an ex- as an example, I mean, they do not Sky is not just the broadcaster of New Zealand rugby. It it is New Zealand rugby in many ways. It's uh, oh, New Zealand rugby has an equity stake in Sky. I think they might have diluted over the last year or so, but it's still there, and they consider themselves broadcast partners. So they're very much a – it's too strong to call them a propaganda arm, but they – and they cover the sport of rugby wonderfully. I, the production values around rugby are second to none. But you don't really get a, a deep dive into the issues surrounding rugby like you will never hear Sky effectively tackle issues like the concussion crisis or you know the dementia crisis in rugby Uh, nor will you really hear them uh, push back and do analysis on private equity deals in rugby or potential private equity deals but that was all right but what I found more and more was that it was actually creeping into other media as well um, I noticed that at NZME before I left that we were extremely cautious around anything we wrote about New Zealand rugby to the detriment, I think. I think, I mean, it's, it might sound a little bit strong, but I think we lost the without fear or favour imperative, which should be a part of every newsroom. And, and one of the reasons uh, for that um, is that the uh, audio rights were being dangled and inserted me one of those audio rights uh, for News Talk ZB. And I believe it started to colour 
what was being written in the New Zealand Herald. I think the boundaries were crossed there. Um, I make no bones about that. Actually, I found it incredibly frustrating. So, yeah, there's a there's a really complex, interesting dynamic with New Zealand rugby in the media, and I believe now that they need the media just as much as we need them. But that kind of uh, that hasn't yet been reflected in their attitude towards us. You know, one of the things, Dylan, that you've made your name on, particularly in recent years, is is investigations. I, I think particularly, you know, the um, of a piece you wrote a few years ago about uh, concussions within a single um, team in, in Taranaki, I think, and, and yeah. how that had impacted, just how many of them had been impacted by that. And, uh, yeah, do you want to talk to me about how you started the... To, to do investigations and why concussions, dementia and that whole piece feels like it's kind of unaddressed within New Zealand sport in a way that it has obviously been enormous, for example, with former NFL players in the US? Yeah, look, I, I think it's going to be a continuing story and one of the key stories for all contact sport um, this century. You know, I think it's that big. Uh, it started actually as in a way that, quite a lot of um, investigations do from very small beginnings. I I was in New Plymouth, which is my hometown, uh, for a Christmas, and I bumped into an old friend, and it was a simple question on the street, is how are you going, how's the family, how's your dad? His dad was a former All Black, and he said, oh, you know, not too good. Um, Dad's got dementia. Uh, it's... You know, he's driving into his car into town, then ringing us up because he's not sure what he's doing in town, why he's even in there. And I actually just thought, you know, that's really quite a a human interest piece about this former All Black, this kind of, um, he was a noted businessman in town as well, about how Alzheimer's, he'd been diagnosed with early onset um, Alzheimer's, how it affects the family. And so I just, I, I kind of broached it. I said, look, I'd quite like to do a human interest story on, on your dad. And it kind of got bounced around the family a bit. And one of his, his other sons uh, rang me and said, yeah, we'd like to do it. I think it's an important story. We think rugby played a part in it. Uh, and started reeling off this list of concussions that his dad had had, some of which he'd been ho- hospitalised with, including on his All Black uh, debut. I said, and I it started, you know, the wheel started turning a little bit more, though. Oh, this is interesting. And then he started listing his dad's teammates from that same Taranaki Ranfordy Shield era that were uh, going through similar things or had previously died with the disease. And yeah, it's just something triggered in my mind that wow, this is this is slightly more than a human interest story. Although that's what it still started off with. The, my original piece was about how this affects the families, how it affects the community, and uh, the feedback I got from it was instant and incredible. And uh, there were just daughters and sons and wives. Uh, emailing me from all around the country saying this has happened to us as well, this has happened to Dad. Uh, Dad was an All Black, such and such, or Dad played for Auckland or Bay of Plenty. And I suddenly realised that I, I mean, we all know when we've got a story that requires lots of follow-ups. I knew I was on something fairly big. And gradually over time, that investigation has kind of gone more and more scientific. I got a scholarship to go to uh, Boston and spend some time with the uh, researchers in the Alzheimer's um, Centre at uh, Boston University Hospital, and that was incredible. And I now I still feel fully invested in that story. I, I still think there's so many more uh, ways that that can go. I still think there's so much more that. Um, rugby administrators around the world I don't, I don't want to sing it out New Zealand rugby here because I don't believe it's just their issue have got to confront and in fact they are going to be forced to confront it because late last year I, I broke the story that um, 
a lawsuit was being prepared in in England and Wales against uh, world rugby, and that has been filed now, and we need to see what happens there. Are the New Zealand sort of victims, if that's the right word, of of you know these these sort of long term brain injuries? Are they limited by the sort of the ACC system, or does the fact that you know, ironically, that they were amateurs um, largely when mm. when that happened, does that sort of put them in a different category? I guess the thing that seems to have, you know, and I'm not sure whether it actually has had a material impact uh, on the the way the game is played in the US, but certainly the the lawsuits that have flowed out of uh, the NFL CTE uh, scandals and so on have tended to kind of at least look at the the wraparound post you know post play care of players and and about what they can do to mitigate the ongoing risk certainly it's more talked about now but you know ha- have you seen material change in in the way that the game is played or the way that uh former players are sort of cared for by by these institutions yeah unfortunately in new zealand the former players aren't really cared for and there's there's not much scope for them either, I think, other than, um, I guess, uniting together and, and forming kind of lobby groups. But I still think that, particularly, as you mentioned, those players from the amateur area era, uh, they're on their own to a certain degree. And, uh, I mean, rugby has still not come out with any hard and fast thing that says, yes, if you play rugby and you over a certain amount of time you are more likely to suffer from um, cognitive issues later in your life and ACC also indemnifies um, New Zealand rugby to an extent Um, but there are New Zealanders I believe that are, are looking closely at what happens in the UK and those that played a couple of years over there, uh, are able to join this class, well, what will potentially be a class action lawsuit to follow, which will follow this very specific lawsuit that's um, been filed at the moment. So, yeah, and but in terms of the way the game's changed, yeah, there's certainly more awareness. There's certainly steps being taken to mitigate the risks of, of um, long-term injuries. I still think there's some way to go, particularly around return to play protocols but there's now a far greater awareness particularly in rugby union uh, that the head is sacrosanct and I think there's a general acceptance that everything about the contact area in rugby has got to get lower and, and that can only be a good thing I don't know that it's a silver bullet in fact I don't think it is I th- I think more and more evidence suggests that uh, the brain is affected from the kind of whiplash elements to to rugby and contact sport, which you you're not going to lose, no matter. Unfortunately, no matter how low the tackle goes, you can mitigate it, but I don't think you're ever going to be able to lose that risk. Yeah, it does feel like something that you know the the more. You know, you look at athletes now versus the you know, the the average weight and and physical conditioning of, of athletes now versus the amateur era. And even if you're not hitting the head, the consequence of conditions, the, the speed and the pounds per square inch being exchanged, uh, the yeah. physics of it are just kind of terrifying. And that and as medical science grows to you know do more studies, understand this, this is this is kind of inevitably going to be uh, you know something that that society really has to, has to wrestle with it loves the sport the sport might be yeah injuring and killing its participants yeah and look it's not just rugby either football was um dealing with the same issue in the uk at the moment all around the world obviously but it seems to be very pointed in the uk that the just the sheer numbers of old football heroes that are, are dying with um dementia is is quite frightening really and yeah, it's it might be the kind of tobacco for the twenty first century, really. Yeah. So switching tack to, to the 
the the the the reason that we all kind of watch and and care about sport in the first place is is the the games or the competitions themselves, and that was something that you listed right at the top of, that has gone away a bit in terms of the you know reporting from the lounge rather than the um, the sideline. Yeah. You know, I, I you can imagine some people kind of viewing that as a nice to have, and certainly some you know. Of the set pieces, you know, Naomi Osaka has been talking about this year, the, the, the sort of, and I have some sympathy for those kind of sort of set piece press conference scrums can often not be particularly illuminating. But the, you know, you you clearly miss the, uh, the, the, the match report where, where you're actually on location and and particularly traveling with the team as, as you've sort of suggested the the period during which news, newspapers and and all media companies are pulled away from traveling with teams for largely for budgetary reasons also coincides with you know our best ever olympics and our um, yeah. you know our, our cricket team suddenly becoming the best in the world quite <laughs> yeah. unexpectedly yeah. Well, what what do you get from you know being that close to the game and what and do you, do you anticipate having the opportunity to kind of you know now that you're your own editor can, will you get back into a bit of that do you think yeah and and I should probably be a little bit clear here as well that I had uh, young children, and I'd stopped travelling with sports teams as well. Like uh, it wasn't that the novelty had worn off; it was just that the practicality of being away from home for a long time had changed for me. So uh, it's been a while since I've been out on the road. Actually, last summer I followed the Black Caps around New Zealand, and that was the first time I'd been back on the road for a while. And what it brought home to me was the massive advantages you have of doing that. Uh, it's not so much access to the players uh, because you can tap into a press conference from anywhere now with your phone, your smartphone. And New Zealand Cricket, for example, are extremely good at getting interviews, audio, um, video out there. They, They have probably the most active communications team uh, of any New Zealand NSO and they're extremely good at it. So being on the road doesn't necessarily help you get the interviews. What it does is give you a, a, a backstage pass really to see how it's all put together. Um, if you're a good reporter, uh, if you write nicely, you can get the reader to the boundary rope, um, if you know what I mean. Uh if you're covering the Olympics, you can get the athlete onto the, you can get the reader onto the start line. It's just, it's. I know it sounds extremely vague, and I'm struggling to articulate it a little bit here. But really good sports writing from the ground just feels different. It reads different. It has some um, implied knowledge that you don't get when you're just covering a game off off a television, and it also builds trust between the reporter and the athletes and the staff as well that you don't get when you're coming out of TV. They see you around. They see that you probably care about the sport. Um, They see the effort that goes into it as well. So it's kind of a two-way thing. And I just, I think that you can't compare the two. You can write a clever match report off the TV, but you'll never get that sense that you will if you've written it from the ground and, and you're, you're part of the machinery, I guess. And yeah, I would love to. I would love to get back on the road a little bit and cover rugby chess, cricket chess, silver ferns, you know, big athletics meets. These are the sort of things that, you know, excite me. And I hope I could bring some of that excitement that you get from being there to readers as well. So finally, just re- returning to the fold, one of the things that you you wrote about and, and acknowledged in the piece and is kind of manifest right now is we're two Pākehā dudes in our you know middle, yeah. middle age um, chatting about this stuff. That that has largely been the reporting core of uh, of sports journalism for for decades. For you know, and you know, one of the things that you you talk about is that that desire to have the the newsletter ultimately become a place that isn't just just your voice um 
that, that that allows for a bit more of a diversity of perspectives too. That kind of goes some way to meeting the diversity of um, you know uh, athletes that that, yeah. that you'll cover. You know, how how do you intend to sort of go about that? And why is that important? Uh, it's my ultimate dream for the for the bounce would be exactly that, would be to bring new voices in, uh, to bring established voices that I enjoy, that I think can offer something to the to the bounce. Uh, I should make it fairly clear that I'm a wee way from being able to do that yet. Um, but, yeah, pale, male and sale, I think is the phrase, wasn't it? And that, that probably did define a lot of sports writing for a while. That's changed. I mean, if, if, if I could blow smoke up the spin-off for a while, there was, I very rarely read or consume content that I'm genuinely jealous about. But I watched that Scratch series and thought, wow, that's, um, that's doing sport differently. Damn, I wish I'd thought of that myself. Uh, so there are there are new ways of covering sport and there are new people doing it and it's fantastic. Uh, and I'd love to house them on the bounce and house some of those ideas and I'm certainly welcome to pitches, um, open to pitches, sorry. But at the moment too, uh, yes, I'm a middle-aged Pakia male, but I still think I've got a bit to offer myself as well. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to reading it and wish you all the best. And we will be publishing one of your stories each week on the spin-off. Um, so there's a little a sampling of, of a way to get in. But if you want to get the free version of it every week, in fact, you, you do the pitch. Uh, <laughs> let, let, tell, tell people what they need to do from here to, to get involved. Yeah, so um, subscribe. You don't you don't have to pay. I'd love you to pay. If you if you don't pay, you'll get um, plenty of my work for free. Uh, certainly, all the long reads and the features that take time to put together um, will be available to every all subscribers. Um, if you pay, uh, again, I'll use that phrase. It's a bit of a backstage pass. You get everything, um, and there'll be different ways that I, I take the bounce in, in the months to come. And some of those will become more evident as we get on, but. You know, I can see kind of live discussions around all black tests and, and threads. And, and if you're a paying subscriber, you will not only be showing your appreciation for the work that goes into it and supporting me, but you'll also be getting access to those kind of things. Uh, so, yeah, please sign up. Um, it will drop straight into your inbox. You don't have to do anything. Uh, you just have to click open and there'll be content for you. I anticipate at least three times a week, sometimes more, maybe in uh, quieter summer months, maybe a couple of times a week, but there'll be loads of content and I'm sure you won't uh, regret it. There'll be no buyer's remorse. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt about that. Thanks so much for coming on The Fold today, Dylan, and all the best with, with the bounce, uh, which you can... Read about on on the read on the spin off uh, the debut issue today. Cheers. Thanks, Jackson. That was the fold brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of the fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The spin-off's new documentary, k Polys follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like celebrate yourself. Watch K Polly's today at the spinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand on here. The Spinoff Podcast Network.